I'm Father Michael Orsi. I'm your host for Action for Life Television, that good news program which brings you the big G, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the little G, all the good things that people do to put that gospel of life into action. Uh, today we're going to go uh, abroad. What do I mean abroad? Well, we're going to talk about a situation that uh, is in a place called China. Now, you know we have a lot of concerns about China these days, the building up of their military, and we have a lot of concerns about our trade with China and how China is expanding its outreach all around the world. Well, one of the situations in China which we have to talk about is their one-child policy. That means couples can have only one child in China. And usually, they want that child to be a male because the male then can take care of them in their old age. And therefore, a lot of little girls get aborted in China or they are put up for adoption. As a matter of fact, I have two nieces who came from China about 20 years ago. And they are a wonderful addition to our family. And we thank God that their birth mother in China did not abort, but chose to give them up to an adoption agency, and then they were brought to this country. So, my dear friends, today we have a wonderful lady on the show. Her name is Reggie Littlejohn, and uh, Reggie uh, runs an organization called Women's Rights Without Frontiers. So I want to talk to her today about the one-child policy in China. I've heard something that they are now allowing two children, but we'll go to the expert and talk to Reggie about what's going on in China with their policy regarding children. Reggie, welcome. Thank you, Father Orsi. It's a delight to be here. Can you tell us about the uh, one-child policy in China? Is it still in effect? Well, the one-child policy changed to a two-child policy in 2016. And as, as you mentioned, now, now the new rule is that every couple is allowed to have two children. And the way that that was announced was China abandons the one-child policy as though they had abandoned all coercive population control. Nothing could be further from the truth. The new rule is every couple is allowed to have two children, which means you have to be part of a couple. So single mothers are still forcibly aborted, and we have a lot of single mothers in the United States. Though all those women would be forcibly aborted in okay, China. Okay, let me go. Let's let's stop for a minute. So every couple can have two children now in China, right? right. Okay. Yeah. Now, if the woman is not married, the government requires that that child be aborted. It, it, it depends on where in China you are. Some women g are given the option of paying a massive fine, but that fine can be up to 10 times a person's annual salary. So just think of how much money a, a, a person would make in, in a year and then multiply that by 10 and see if they could come up with that kind of money to maintain an illegal pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that third children are also not allowed, and um, this has been used as a real hammer in the Xinjiang province among the Uyghurs. Uh, so the Chinese Communist Party, th there was recently an article, like I think last October, by Radio Free Asia of uh, medical personnel who had escaped from Xinjiang and who said that women were being aborted up to the ninth month of pregnancy, that they were practicing infanticide, that full full-term babies that are born were being killed if they were third children. Why did China change from the one-child policy to a two-child policy? The reason they changed was very simple. It, it, was, it was not because they wanted to reduce coercion. They're still practicing coercion. But um, they, they see that they are heading into a demographic disaster because, number one, they don't have enough girls. And number two, they don't have enough young people to support their rapidly aging population. So um, I am calling upon them this week to completely end all coercion in China because they, they know they need, new, they need young people. They need babies. Um, they need even their workforce is going down so that China is no longer the place where you can get the cheapest labor. There's other, other countries that have a, a bigger population to support that labor. 
And so this week, the Chinese government is meeting in their annual legislative session, which is really a rubber stamp session. And because their population has not rebounded the way that they had hoped it, to, it would under the two-child policy, they have no excuse whatsoever to maintaining any kind of population control on people. They need more babies. Okay, let me ask you this. I'm told that oftentimes older people are not taken care of because they should be taken care of by their children, but there are no children to take care of them, especially if that one child happens to be a girl. So how does that safety net work if there is one in China? There is no safety net, Father Orsi. So that, this is a very, very important problem. The, the one-child policy has decimated the, the family structure in China. Now, we are the only organization in the world that has a network on the ground inside of China that is actively saving baby girls and saving uh, abandoned widows because what's happening is that over the last 20 years, in conjunction with the one-child policy, senior suicide in China has skyrocketed 500%. And China also has the highest female suicide rate of any country in the world. It's the only country in the world where more women than men kill themselves. And in the Chinese countryside where we are, uh, it's three times the number of women and men as men kill themselves. So we have field workers. We're the only organization that has field workers on the ground inside of China that is saving baby girls from gender side, that's sex elective abortion or abandonment, or also grinding poverty and also saving abandoned widows. And we give them like a stipend of $25 a month to just help them just live and, and to restore their dignity and to show that they're worth something. And the government yeah. lets you stay there? Why? They're such Pardon a closed me? country. I was in China maybe, maybe about five years ago and they try to present themselves as a very open society. Uh, however, they made sure I only went to certain places. And they even followed me when I went to church and made believe the church was closed. It took me three days to get into a church. I don't, I, don't go, it's, I don't go to China. It would be insanity for me to go to China. China. China practices what I would call hostage diplomacy, so that when they are in a struggle with another country, they will just take their citizens and, and detain them. So right now they have two Canadian businessmen that are detained. What I do is I, they, they deny forced abortion. Uh, they deny what they're doing to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. I expose it. So if I went over there, I could be detained or worse for uh, what they would call exposing state, state secrets. So I don't go there. The, the network that we have is of people who are local uh -huh. uh, fr from that area and who are taking their freedom into their hands to get out there every day and, and get these stipends to these mothers of, of girls and also to these, these impoverished widows. So what they will do, let's ex try to explain this so that even I can understand it. Uh, you are financially supporting these uh, people. Right. And, so, so, and, yeah, and also right. so, uh, hel helping uh, these uh, uh, older people who have no means of support but also you're helping uh, to take the little girl babies and get them homes, adoption. Uh, how do you no, do no, this? No. We, we have nothing to do with adoption. What our, our model is to help the mother keep her daughter. Uh huh. So what typically happens, and I sent you uh, a couple of videos. I, I don't know if you might be willing to play these videos because they're really powerful and you will see the faces of some of the baby girls that we're saving and the faces of some of the widows that we're saving. But in terms of the baby girls, what will typically happen is um, a woman will get pressured by her mother-in-law. And this is particularly the case with second daughters. Okay, in, in the countryside, typically they will let the first daughter live um, because they can figure they can have a son on, on the second child. But then some families, will just abort and abort and abort until they get that boy and the second child. In fact, there was a woman several years ago whose husband forced her to abort four baby girls in one year and then she died. 
Um, so what, what happens is the mother-in-law and the husband start to pressure the woman to get an ultrasound. And the woman typically resists this because she knows what that means. She knows that once she gets that ultrasound, if it's a boy, she'll be allowed to keep him. If it's a girl, she will be pressured to abort her. So, um, so f there was a woman a number of years ago that was being pressured by her mother-in-law to get the ultrasound, she dragged her feet until she was well into her pregnancy. I don't know whether she was seven months, eight months pregnant. I don't know what she was, but she, but they found on the ultrasound that not only was she carrying one, but she was carrying two baby girls. Wow! So she would have she would have used up her entire um, quote quota of children in one pregnancy and both girls. So then the mother-in-law started really intensely pressuring her to abort those girls, and she did not want to. So our field worker, thank God found out about this and went to her and said, congratulations on your baby girls. Girls are as good as boys, which is a radical statement in the Chinese countryside. And um, we will give you two monthly stipends for a year to empower you to keep your daughters. So these stipends are $25 a month um, that, we, that our field workers will go to give to these women and they will sign a chart showing that they received the money. And what that does is it enables the woman to push back against you know, the pressure to either abort or abandon her baby. Um, now, we, what we've done also has been really important under the coronavirus because our area, like I think much or all of China, was shut down during the coronavirus. And our um, many of our families are farming families and they could not sell their, their vegetables uh, or, or their chicken eggs or whatever in the market because everything was on lockdown. And they were forced into poverty, like abject poverty, extreme poverty. And there was at least a couple families that were actually thinking about giving away their baby girl as an extra mouth to feed. And we were able to get to them and get these stipends to them to help them to keep their daughters. So that's, so that's when, our model. When we talk Helping about, you know, the baby, uh, they, want, they, they don't want the baby girls, but they want the boys. You know, so you could have, if you want, you could have two boys. That that works. Sure, families would love to have two boys. Okay, and that's kind of like their uh, social security for their old age. Exactly. That that that's right. That's one of the big reasons that that people in China and India prefer boys over girls is that uh, when in in Chinese culture and Indian culture, when a young couple marries, traditionally the young woman goes over to the young man's family, lives in that household, and mm -hmm. supports his parents in their old age. And so that's what they have instead of Social Security. So a lot of families feel that if, uh, if they're pregnant with a girl, especially a second girl, they have a choice of either aborting that girl or giving her away um, or facing poverty in their old age. Okay, let me ask you about, um, at a certain point, uh, a young man is going to be looking for a, a wife, okay? Now, it would seem to me, I mean, I've, I've never been a, a star in mathematics, but if you don't have enough girls and you have all of these boys, uh, well, I, I think you're looking for trouble. What right, happens? and that's one of the reasons that they shifted from a one-child policy to a two-child policy. Um, but yeah, you are, you are um, heading in, into trouble, and that's one of the reasons that China is one of the worst countries in the world in terms of human trafficking and sexual slavery. So they traffic women from within China, and they also tra traffic women from the surrounding countries and as far away as you know, South America and Africa. So they bring, forced, they bring women off. in. They bring women into China to right. uh, take care of their uh, male population. Force, they can be forced brides, and they can also be prostitutes. And one of the reasons that China, according to the Trafficking in Persons report that is put out by the State Department every year, China is, is a tier three nation, which is one of the worst nations. Um, it's the lowest rating you can get, is because the um, police in China, the government in China is not cracking down on these traffickers enough. Uh, and I believe the reason that they're not doing it is because they know that they've got an extra 30 to 40 million men living in China, more than women, um, and that if they don't have trafficked women, they're going to have an insurrection on their hands. So it's just, it's an extremely ugly situation. Yeah, I can't see how the, uh, the young men are uh, going to be kept under control uh, in, in China. Uh, 
Well, what do the Chinese do with these young, unattached men uh, who under the best of circumstances sometimes can find themselves uh, in, into, into mischief? What do they do with them? Well, I mean, I, I don't really know what they do with them. I think that uh, there's something in China called bachelor villages. So women are upwardly mobile because there aren't enough of them. So women who are in the outlying areas will typically marry upward in the town or the city. Mm -hmm. And so then you have these whole villages where there isn't anybody except for men and elderly. And that is a recipe uh, for, for insurrection. And another thing that they can do with them is put them in the army. You know, they're building a huge army. Imagine producing this wonderful program, Action for Life, it costs a great deal of money. We're going to need your help. So if you would like to donate to keep this good news program on the air, please, please go to your computer, your cell phone, actionforlife.net. Our thought for the day, I hope that all of you have Bibles in your home. The Bible is the Word of God, and there's nothing more powerful than God's Word. Keep it in a prominent place to remind you that you are part of God's good news and that God is using you to do His will. Yes, they, they, are, building, they are building a huge army, and uh, a lot of uh, people are concerned about uh, the Chinese and their, um, their, their, their quest for power uh, around around the world, and yet what you're telling me, I, I don't see it as um, something that is viable if you are killing off your female population, if you don't have enough people to uh, repopulate uh, China, and if you are persecuting groups, like you mentioned the Uyghurs, we've hear, heard a lot about them uh, of late. I want you uh, to tell me, uh, you are involved in uh, advocacy for human rights, and you, br you bring these situations to world bodies, UN, okay? What do they say about this? Well, okay, Father Orsi, I mean, there, I mean, there's a couple things I can say about that, and I do, I have two, two, last year I went and, and presented at, no, it was the year before last year, because last year was COVID, but, a couple of years ago, I, I actually presented at the, um, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, that was like one of the highlights of my entire career. And um, I'm, I have two, um, two events I'm putting on at the UN this month, later this month, uh, in connection with, with the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. So on one hand, I think that the international bodies have been responsive, and the United States, in, in particular, has been very responsive. And you know, Secretary of State Michael Pompeo, on his last day of office, uh, declared what was going on in Xinjiang to be genocide, which was a huge deal. Um, and the European Parliament uh, had passed a resolution condemning forced abortion in China. The United Nations uh, Commission on the Status of Women, Women condemned forced abortion. They didn't say anything about China. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do believe that we are having an impact. Okay, that being said, on the other hand, China is incredibly powerful at the UN. And it's, a, it's, a, it's soft power. It's like they, they give money to nations, and it really, and, and so then these nations feel that they have to vote and, and not hold uh, China accountable. China is one of the worst human rights violators in the world. They sit on the uh, UN Human Rights Council. Uh, and so... The United Nations is really not a place that is going to take China to task in the way that it really should, in the way that it was designed to do. Are you uh, are you concerned uh, about China 
becoming the uh, premier world power? Uh, yes, I am. Because that's okay. certainly their aim. And that, and that, they, that, is, that, is their, that is their aim. And you say they're, 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 they're buying uh, a lot of their uh, influence uh, through the UN. They're buying their influence in uh, our higher education uh, places where they can promote their ideology. They can uh, promote their uh, quest for world dominance. Yes. There, okay. There's there's a there's something. There was a document that was, I guess, leaked. Uh, maybe about the turn of the millennium, called "Unrestricted Warfare," mm -hmm. and it was um, written by a couple of Chinese military men about how to take over the United States, how to how can a weaker power take over a stronger military power, and so kinetic warfare is just one part of it, but, but there's economic warfare, there's information warfare, there's cultural warfare. So um, as you mentioned, you know, they, they have a strong impact in, in our education system, including in our universities, in two ways. One is the Confucius Institute, which is actually just Chinese propaganda, and, I, and, and the Trump administration took action against them, and the Biden administration has opened the door again to the Confucius, having Confucius Institutes at our universities um, and at our schools. And the second one is that the Chinese Communist Party um, donates heavily to our, 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 our educational institutions. And you know, I believe that these institutions need to be required to disclose how much money they're getting from the Chinese Communist Party. So this this is also in, uh, like, for example, the China departments or Chinese studies departments at universities are a, a lot of times are funded or partially funded by the Chinese Communist Party. And so the China scholars are in a situation where they are really are, can't um, they, they can't really criticize the Chinese government because they will, number one, yank their funding, and number two, will not allow them into China. And if you're a China scholar, you need to be able to get into China. So um, they, they have a heavy influence in Hollywood because Hollywood is basically lusting over the idea of getting their films into this enormous Chinese market, and so that they have... Um, basically clamped down on the film industry, that, it, that it's almost impossible to get a major film made that's critical of China. Um, so, so we are not, and, and then in the media, okay, they are heavy advertisers in a lot of the media outlets, and so a lot of the media outlets are reluctant to publish the truth about the human rights atrocities in China. This is, this is uh, astounding. It, it, it's frightening. What I saw when I was looking over what your organization does is something that uh, maybe you could talk about. It seems to me that even women who are ideologically different, opposed to pro-life, should be concerned about what's going on in China, especially the, the welfare of young girls, babies, women who are being bullied by the government. Do you work together with <coughs> pro-choice people to stop this gendercide? This is what I had hoped, Father Orsi, uh, in establishing Women's Rights Without Frontiers, is that we would be able to draw together the left and the right, pro-choice and pro-life together to oppose forced abortion, because forced abortion is not a choice. So you would think that the um, people who are pro-choice would be jumping up and down against this forced abortion. And you would think that people who say that they are pro-women would be jumping up and down against the sex-selective abortion of baby girls just because they're girls. And I think that the rank-and-file pro-choice person really is pro-choice, and they really would be outraged by all of this. But I think the leadership of the uh, so-called pro-choice movement, is, uh, and they've done nothing. I mean, there have been so many atrocities that have occurred, and they've just been mostly silent, 99% silent have, on these Have things. they been bought? Ladies and gentlemen, you know, I think that they, they've been bought. You know, these people who are supposedly feminists care about uh, women and women's issues, and yet they seem to be on board with a communist agenda promoting a communist ideology 
right here in our own country. You heard Reggie talk about the Confucius Institute. Reggie, can you talk about this? I mean, are, are, are we really fooling ourselves into believing, hey, you know, these people are, you know, pro-women. In effect, what they are is that they are pro-communist. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that they're pro-communist. I have no evidence that, for example, Planned Parenthood is receiving funding from the Chinese Communist Party. What, what I would say is I think that they are pro-population control. It, it, and they are willing to turn a blind eye to however it's done. So, and I, and I would say that they're pro-abortion. I think that they, um, they're, they're not, this is, it, it, okay, put it this way. If you're truly pro-choice, so let's say a woman is pregnant and, 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 and she's, it's a problematic pregnancy, okay, it, that, that she, um, she got pregnant um, unintentionally. Now, let's say you really want her to have a choice mm -hmm. You, you would be in support of the pregnancy centers because they're going to give her the choice. It's like, okay, look, if she wants to have an abortion, great. You know, Planned Parenthood will provide it, but also Planned Parenthood really wants her to have a genuine choice. And therefore, you know, we support having all of these, you know, pregnancy centers that can help her have the baby if that's what she wants for her choice. That's not what it is. They're trying to shut down the pregnancy centers. Why? Why? These, are, these pregnancy centers are giving women a real choice if they want to keep their babies. So if you're in favor of choice, you should be in favor of having pregnancy centers as well that will help women have a baby if that's what they want to do. Ladies and gentlemen, population control. Basically, it means sterilization. It means abortion. There is very little choice in population control. Our institutions of higher learning and big business are being bought out by the communist government. And they're going to take over the world. If not by force, they're going to take over the world by ideology. I'm delighted that Reggie Littlejohn has been with us today. And until next time, I'm for action, and I hope you are too. We would like to thank our generous sponsors for their wonderful support. Thanks for watching. Please join us next time for Action for Life. I'm for action and I hope you are too. I'm Father Michael Orsi. I am your host for Action for Life Television, that good news program which talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the big G and the little G, all the good things that people are doing to put the gospel of life into action. So please join us for the next episode of Action for Life.